now let's welcome back Dr. Walter Willett. Uh, as a reminder, for those of you who may not have joined us yesterday, Walter is professor and past chairman of the Department of Nutrition, Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, and chair of our Menus of Change Scientific and Technical Advisory Council, as well as co-chair of the Eat Lancet Commission uh, to help introduce our next session and uh, transition us from seafood to carbon. We've got Dr. Walter Willett. Hi, Walter. Uh, hi, Jackie. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Fabrice de Clerc, who actually was part of the previous session. If you were part of that, you already uh, know Fabrice uh, very briefly. He's science, been science and is science director of the EAT Foundation and was very key to pulling together our EAT Lancet report. He's senior scientist at Bioversity International and uh, a, a, a valuable expert in many different fields connecting agriculture, food, and health. Uh, and uh, we thought it was really important to, uh, to have a bit of uh, a bit of a session, at least here uh, in the uh, agricultural per whole chain production chains in terms of uh, environmental impacts, in particular greenhouse gas emissions. So, uh, we may want a larger section on this another year, but uh, it's really important to introduce this topic and no better person than Fabrice. I won't take any, of your, any more of your time. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks, Walter. It's great to see you again. And I hope you're you're well uh, back uh, back in Boston. Uh, hello, everyone. So, so welcome back. And what I'd like to speak to over just 10 minutes is assessing carbon strategies from carbon capture to decarbonizing food systems. Uh, we are going to nerd out a little bit. There will be some figures. Bear with me. I'm going to try to walk you through the uh, take home messages and, and we'll wrap up with what I think uh, I hope uh, are succinct to take home messages for you all. So next slide, please. So, so one, uh, you know, what I really want to emphasize is we're just coming out of the COVID crisis. And, and I think there's several lessons that come from this. You know, one is that when we need to, we are able to, to act and, and react. Uh, and I think COVID has caused a lot of suffering. It's shut down economies. Uh, and it's asked us to make sacrifices uh, in order to hopefully build back better and now that we're starting to get a grip up on this pandemic. This is two years uh, that's taken out of, of our life, taken out of the global economy. And I think what I want to just stress with this slide is that we know that climate change is coming. In fact, climate change is, is now here. Uh, we're at 1.1 degrees warming compared to uh, historical. Uh, and we're beginning to see the impacts, whether it's the increased tropical storms, whether it's the fires uh, in my, my native California, uh, in Zimbabwe, uh, in Australia. Reversing action on climate change will take much longer than two years. It will take much more uh, than, than a vaccine. And so it's really just critically important that we take this very seriously and that we really begin to mobilize now uh, to reverse uh, climate change. Uh, next slide, please. The the data is also quite clear. 30% uh, of greenhouse gas emissions come, come from food. Uh, this may be different in industrialized nations where it's a bit less compared to in developing nations. Uh, a lot of this comes from converging intact ecosystems, forests, entire cultural systems. Some of this comes from the energy that we use to supply and drive coal chains. Transportation is a big part of this as well. Uh, and then, uh, of course, agricultural production uh, is a big part of it. When we talk about the transportation, packaging, retail, there's some really interesting technological solutions that are emerging. Electrification of supply chains, for example, uh, and uh, transition to reliance on renewable resources are certainly actions that we all can be taking in our supply chains. The other side of it is, I think, really beginning to recognize that we have to halt conversion of land, intact lands, to keep emissions locked up in land, in vegetation rather than the atmosphere. And we also have to shift how we produce food. Next slide, please. But what we're seeing is that the proportion of greenhouse gases on the left that are coming from food are decreasing 
But uh, much of this is driven to a continued increase on the right of global greenhouse gas emissions. So we're still not yet bending the curve, beginning to decrease a global emissions. We're, we're really needing to see that green line and that red line uh, on the uh, right hand figure begin to tip off and stabilize. Uh, this is uh, that needs to happen over the next two to three years. Next slide, please. I know this is really complicated. Uh, but all of us, I think, have used a Manhattan metro map to navigate to the subway. And this is what this is. This is a subway map of greenhouse gas emissions from, from food. The top two at the top there, the, the blue line transition to the green line, this is the greenhouse gas emissions that come from food production uh, and from land use conversion. So, so how we produce food and our conversion of land for food production are 66% of the emissions that come from, uh, from food production. The rest is energy, industry, uh, and waste, which account for much smaller proportions. Big parts of those land-based emissions are how we convert land to produce more food, so clearing of tropical forests, carbon-dense peatlands, converging grasslands into row crop systems. All of these are changes from one land system to another, uh, which lead to emissions, to, be, to lead to uh, the carbon dioxide being lost from land, from vegetation, and put into the atmosphere. A lot of this, 26%, uh, is, uh, sorry, a lot of this, 32%, is land use change. 40% of it is how we produce food, and driven largely by two big sources, methane emissions from rice cultivation. When we flood lands, decomposition produces methane rather than carbon dioxide. And the second is enteric fermentation by, by livestock, 17% of, of food-based greenhouse gas emissions. When livestock chew food, digest it, they emit methane, which is a powerful uh, greenhouse gas. So land use conversion, methane emission from rice and livestock are the biggest sources of greenhouse gases uh, when we think about how we produce food. Next slide, please. This is work by uh, our, our Lancet Commissioner, David Tillman, led by actually one of our Lancet scientists, uh, Mike Clark, which looked at what are the odds of our being able to stay within a two degree of climate warming or within a 1.5 degree climate warming. And the reason this slide is important is that what Mike finds uh, is that even if we are very good at reducing non-food based emissions, the probability uh, of our uh, achieving uh, the Paris Climate Agreement of staying within two degrees is between 50 to 67 percent of, of a chance. So, so those are important, but it's still a fairly low odds for something as important as climate change. What Mike then looked at, and these are the, the blue and green values on, on the left, is what would be the contributions of food-based emissions in increasing those odds? So here looks at business as usual in black. Can we improve production efficiency, that is produce more food with less energy in terms of high yields? Can we reduce uh, waste? Can we transition towards healthy diets, healthy calories? Can we improve the efficiency uh, of food production? What about if we're more aggressive and move towards more plant-rich diets, you know, bordering on vegetarian or, or vegan? And what he finds is, is that each of these by itself has an impact but really, if we're serious about achieving the Paris Climate Agreement, implementing all of these with at least half of a level of effort brings us within a 50-50 chance of staying within 1.5 degrees, brings us in within a much greater chance, 100% chance of staying within two degrees. If we implement all of these at once, we get to the 100%. So I think the key message from my Clark and colleagues is that the odds of staying within a stable climate are significantly greater when we look at both production side, consumption side, uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions, in addition to uh, other sector. Next slide, please. So uh, what are the recommendations? I realize there's something in the debate. Do I do regenerative agriculture or do I focus on, on consumption? And I think what I really want to emphasize is it's an all hands on deck moment. Uh, and really we have to look at both consumption and production side. So on the consumption side, healthy meat proportions. Uh, we really need to be working with citizenry uh, to bring down particularly a red meat consumption within healthy levels. Uh, and as a reminder, I think the Eat Lancet recommendation was zero to 100 grams of beef and lamb per week. 
uh, or zero to 100 grams uh, per, per week. Second, Plant Forward. You guys are the champions uh, at Plant Forward, diversifying our menus. And as we had in the last conversation, create conversation. Uh, let your clients know uh, that some of what you're offering them is not only delicious, but also is a means of uh, being participating in reducing climate risks. Next slide, please. The, the second thing I just want to emphasize is when we look at the, the recommendations, uh, we, we often, I think, have been stuck on, on these values. I just want to emphasize that another way you might look at this and communicate this is thinking about how many portions of these foods that we have per week. So it's less than one portion per week of beef and lamb. It's less than one portion per week of, of pork. Uh, it's zero to four portions per week of poultry and zero to seven portions per week uh, of, of fish. And that allows for the vegan, vegetarian, but also uh, the, the flexitarian options. Last slide, please, or second last slide, please. Uh, I don't want to dwell on this too much, but on the production side, what I really want to emphasize is that there's significant potential in what we're calling regenerative agriculture, right? Th those practices that take carbon from the atmosphere and through photosynthesis, through plant production, put them back into soil. And that's, that's about the middle of this figure here, ag and grasslands. And quite a bit of it comes from how we produce food, how we, uh, whether we graze livestock, feed additives that we might add to livestock, conservation agriculture and tillage. But most important is that top line, reforestation and void conversion. We really have to become much more efficient at reducing land that's lost uh, for, uh, for us to achieve this battle. Last slide for my wrap up, Jackie. I see you glaring at me in a very friendly way. Uh, my last slide is just the production recommendations. Pro farmer, pro rancher. This is not about pitting the production community against the consumption community. And you as chefs really are tremendous here in being able to tell the stories of those farmers who are making efforts to do things the right way. Zero deforestation, we have to halt conversion. Grass fed on grass under pastures, minimizing feed when we can, improving feed, including with seaweed to reduce methane emissions, focus on regenerative or circular integrated practices, and last, as with the product consumption side, create the conversation around the topic. You really are, are I think, our best advocates on this side. Thanks for bearing with me, Jackie. I hope that was useful, uh, and I look forward to seeing you all soon, I hope. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Fabrice. I know that you were covering a lot of um, complex and intense science and translating it for all of us. So really appreciate you covering that. We've got the slides um, from Fabrice's presentation also available so that if you want to dig in further, um, you can do that. At, up next, we have several more breakout sessions for you to choose from. But first, we've got some networking to do. Thank you to today's networking sponsors, Oatly, who is sponsoring this networking time coming up, as well as Aramark, who is sponsoring the networking time immediately following our breakout sessions. They've each provided some delicious snack inspiration recipes to try out, an avocado, oat milk, and strawberry smoothie, as well as a mango and coconut curry yogurt savory parfait. By participating in the networking activities happening now and following the breakout, the breakout sessions, you'll have the chance to win some great prizes. Those activities include um, our networking feature. Today's icebreaker question is, what steps are you or your company taking to reduce your carbon footprint? And I think that Fabrice's presentation gives us some ideas here in case uh, you're wondering what you can be doing to reduce your carbon footprint. You should also connect with Larissa Zimbaroff, who is author of Technically Food, Inside Silicon Valley's Mission to Change What We Eat. She'll be appearing in the Food, Tech, and Sustainability Break out session and then popping over to the meet the author booth at 1210 Pacific. We also have special demonstrations, presentations, and discussion happening in the sessions tab. And don't forget to head to the Sustainability Innovation Hub to visit our generous sponsors. Today's themes and activities are different from yesterday's, so make sure you check out the hub today. Here's how to get to the breakout sessions after you've consumed all of the networking fun. You're going to hit that sessions tab um, once we finish with this networking time. And here's also an overview of what's coming up the rest of the day, starting with heading to networking, followed by breakouts at 11.30 a.m. Pacific, 2.30 p.m. Eastern. Then another round of networking, meet the author booths, special sessions, and innovation hub activities at 12.10 Pacific. 
And then believe it or not, tomorrow is our final day of the summit already. I feel like we're just getting started and just getting into the real uh, meat, the plant-based meat of things. We'll be starting again at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern with visits to Southeast Asia, China, and Korea to gain insights from their Plant Forward Culinary Insight. And we'll talk to an incredible panel of food business leaders on how to cultivate leadership and accelerate social entrepreneurship to meet the sustainability challenges of the future. For now, though, enjoy the networking.